Well, thanks to our all of the people who went to general convention. I've been to four of them as a deputy, as an al one alternate, three as a deputy. And um, they are very energizing. They're very arduous, time consuming, and it takes a lot of energy, emotional and uh, just in terms of just human grit to, to make your way through two weeks of legislative sessions, especially in the general convention of the Episcopal Church because we, we are not always of one mind. That doesn't come as any surprise to you. But that's not, that's not new, by the way. That's the way it's, we've always been. I have to really ha uh, hasten to always add that. This is not a new phenomena that we are a big tent denomination. We always have been, I hope we always will be, from the Elizabethan settlement in 1602 until now when Richard Hooker wrote the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. We have been a big tent communion, the Anglican communion, and particularly in the United States, we are a big tent. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we love this church of ours, is because uh, we can be just about anything we are, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, traditionalist, progressive, and anything in between. And you have a place at the table literally at the table of the Episcopal Church. And as I say every Sunday, um, you know, this communion's for all baptized, but I add, you know, I add, unless the bishop's here, um, I add. <laughs> and this is an open communion and all are welcome. Um, and the image, of course, the image of our big tent communion is ba based on Jesus. That's it, that's our core. It's not based on on my political persuasion or yours. It's not based on um, any of those secondary things. It's based on Jesus. And so this would be how it would work, is if Jesus, Jesus had a Last Supper, okay, in the upper room. Can you imagine Jesus being the host of the Last Supper? Someone comes in as a stranger who doesn't have a reservation, who's not expected at the meal. Can you imagine Jesus of Nazareth saying, I'm sorry, you can't come in here. That doesn't sound like him, does it? No, he would say, pull up another chair, right? If they said, well, I'm Muslim, can you imagine Jesus saying, then you don't have a place at our table. Come on, uh, that, this theology really is easy. Jesus' hospitality is radical. Now, we may not like that. Uh, we, may, we, we may like to be able to choose who's at the table. <clears throat> and uh, we've been doing a lot of that, by the way, over the years. I, as, as, as I said in the sermon, I grew up in the Deep South. I don't have any, need to have any education about who can sit at my table and who can't. We had a lot of us and thems um, in the South. And um, I'm not going to pick on any other part of the country. I just pick on my own. And, um, and I sa I've said this already. Um, um, you know, I have relatives who have um, Confederate flags in, in the back of their pickup trucks. Today, now, cousins who have Confederate flags in the back of their pickup, they, they think that we are really strange. That, this part of the family, my part of the family, we think that their part of the family is really strange. <laughs> um, so I'm really glad that the Confederate flag came down from the um, pole in, in South Carolina. Um, I don't care where you all on that. Um, that's a, that's a, a symbol of, of um, separation for a lot of our people. On to the national church, though. The first thing to say um, is not in your packet, is that we went through a total reorganization of the national church, and it was passed. Let me tell you how severe. If you're a Republican and you like less federal government, this is for you. So this is, this is your moment in the sun. Your moment in the sun if you're a Republican. I never tell you what my political persuasion is. I always leave that neutral and it's my own business, um, so I never tell you whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat. But if you're a Republican, this is happy news for you because we used to have 14 commissions, standing commissions of the National Church. 14. Guess how many we have now? Two. <laughs> Two. And uh, the presiding bishop remembered all of the ones. A little dig at our governor. Uh, remember, he forgot, he forgot which, ones he, which one he was going to reduce, uh, former governor. Anyway, 14 down to 2. Uh, that's an amazing accomplishment. And, um, and I, for one, am really pleased about that. 
Um, I think our national church had grown and grown and grown and grown and was costing more and more and more money and was less local and was less attentive to the marrow of the church. Um, it was a lot of there was a lot of hierarchy and a lot of commissions who didn't have a lot of in touchness. I know that's not a word, but in touchness with those of us who are doing local work. And I'm really glad we're down to two. It's it's down to the structures and canons of the church. That's one commission, and and liturgy and music. That's the second commission. All the others will have to be appointed by the presiding bishop, but they're not going to be a commission. They're not a standing commission anymore. They're always a task force, and you know the difference is a task force starts and stops. Task forces are born to start and stop. To have a sunset rule is always a good thing. Uh, starting them are, are good. Stopping them is good. So uh, that's really great news, and we're st saving a bunch of money. That's good, too. Um, because if I have a conservative leaning, and I do, I, uh, conservation's a good thing, conservative, especially if it conserves that which is time-honored and really feeds the life and the health of the church. And that is, we were spending a lot of money on things that we weren't really sure that we should spend money on anymore. And um, I think being frugal is a good thing these days, and paying our bills is a good thing, and not having red ink is a good thing. You've heard me say this. Um, I think churches and families should, should make their way and shouldn't have red ink. I think it's a better way to live myself, and um, I think for the church it's a much better way to live. So um, I'm really pleased about that. The, uh, by the way, the, uh, the new resolution uh, that brought us down to two, and now it would be an app appointed by the presiding bishop, it has to be approved. His now, Michael Curry, his appointments of a task force have to be approved by the executive council, on which Sherry, Shelley Vescovo sat once upon a time on the executive council of the National Church. That's, I, I was, I'm really proud when I, when I say that. I, I hope you know what that means. She was one of 16, maybe? 16 people around the country who was serving at, at the highest level of our church. And so she knows better than I do, you know, Shelley, what it is like to sit in that room and deal with this monstrous national church and its budget. And um, so we're lean and mean, <laughs> and we're down to two commissions. Could you have imagined that, Shelley? <laughs> and um, it'll be interesting to see what Michael Curry then puts forward in terms of the, his new appointed uh, task forces. I think he's going to probably have something about evangelism, because um, that's, I'll get to that in a minute. Any questions about the structures? The structure business, taking 14 down to 2. Question? 14 down to 2. Liter and one's, one's called, um, this is a long, Structure, Governance, Constitution, and Canons is the first commission, and then Standing Commission on Liturgy and Music. Hmm. I will. The, I, thought, I, thought, I, thought someone was, I thought someone was gonna ask me, so here you go, ready? You don't write all these down, it'll be on the video. Just log on to the website, um, Anglican and International Peace with Justice Concerns. That's an important topic. Communication and Information Technology. Constitution and Canons, that's, that's, a, that's been rolled into now structure and governance. Ecumenical and interreligious relations. Health. Lifelong Christian formation and education. Liturgy and music, that's continuing. Ministry development, mission and evangelism, small congregations, social justice and public policy, stewardship and development, structure of the church, world mission. Those are the 14. So, good news. Um, Michael Curry will have a, have a good time putting together a, a national church now where he doesn't have to be encumbered with a lot of things that have hand, been handed on to him. Imagine if you were George W. Bush or, or um, Barack Obama and, um, and you came into the White House and they said, you got a clean slate. What would that be like? <laughs> 
it, it would put a smile on both of their faces, I can tell you. Because can you imagine being the president coming in the first day and they say, okay, you got 20 zillion commissions and whatever that you got to deal with, including an FBI and a CIA and all that. Wow. Okay, the second thing that I'd like to tackle um, is, there, is the provision for same-sex marriage now and uh, what would broadly be called marriage equality. And that starts in your packet. The first um, resolution that was adopted um, is A054, which is a liturgical resource for the National Church. So the bottom line is this, the National Church works on liturgy and music, as you know, as it relates to all local congregations. All of us are expected to follow the rubrics and the manner and the guidelines of worship in the Episcopal Church. I make a pact, actually a, a promise when I'm ordained, that I will follow the constitution and canons of the Episcopal Church, which includes its worship and liturgy. That is, I cannot freely break um, rubrics in the prayer book. But there's a lot of liturgies that are passed at the national level, and this is one of them now. So there's a new rite um, that would be called marriage, um, a litur liturgical rite now, national liturgical rite, approved for the church to use for same-sex marriage. Was well, blessings, of course. Um, I don't know that there's going to be many couples now that it's a national law, the law of the land of marriage, that will want to be blessed. Although, as a, as a straight couple, Valerie and I like our marriage to be blessed a lot. In fact, we have anniversaries where we will um, have our anniversary blessed and, and gay couples will ask the same thing. And we have houses that are blessed, and we, but you know, we don't bless the walls and the lights when we bless a house. We bless the life that is lived in a house, the relationships and the life that's lived there. So we really are doing a couple blessing or a family blessing when we're doing a house blessing, really. Or a business blessing, same thing if you ever have your business blessed. We're not um, blessing the bricks and mortar of your office building, we're blessing the enterprise and the industry that would happen um, in, in the, an office, right? So we're blessing people, not things. As my theology <laughs> professor always said, Jesus blessed people, not things. So um, we're blessing people in this liturgy with, in holy matrimony. You can read it for yourself. Um, it is marriage. I know that for some people, um, the traditional language of marriage <clears throat> um, always um, meant for you, uh, meant for society, um, one man and one woman. There's still a lot, of, a lot of angst and disagreement in our society about this on the meaning of marriage and in the church particularly. Christian marriage, the Episcopal Church has joined up now with the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the UCC Church, United Church of Christ, and now uh, we're the fourth denomination that is now has a national liturgy um, where we um, have Christian marriage for gay and straight couples. So that's what this is. And um, it's, a, it's a uniform liturgy that's to be used. It has to be used, though. The second resolution that's before you is then um, A036, which is an amended canon. Now it's a canon, which then says this liturgy can be exercised only at the approval of the local diocesan bishop. Diocesan bishops have the authority then, this resolution says, to decide whether the liturgy is to be exercised in your diocese. Um, it was already being exercised, that is, liturgies for marriage in the states where they it was already legal. For example, New York, where I'm going for a year to be the interim rector. The bishop of New York was already allowing um, Christian marriage in Episcopal churches, and they were using a liturgy that he approved uh, in that diocese. And so that, this was already going on in some states where marriage was already legal. Now that it's the law of the land, then dioceses have to, have to figure this out on whether they're going to have marriage, whether they're going to have blessings. I guess there could be a, I haven't heard of a diocesan bishop who has said, we're going to, we know that marriage is the legal law of the land, but we're not going to allow marriages, but we're going to allow same-sex blessings in our diocese. I haven't heard that little slice yet, but that's a question that's been raised. Usually it's a yes or no on marriage right now. And um, 
again, the resolution speaks for itself. It basically says the, the Episcopal Church on, on the, a variety of, of uh, ways of getting at this topic that is in terms of equal rights, in terms of the reading of scripture, in terms of theology, in terms of any manner of seeing this, the Episcopal Church that goes on record saying, we think this is a blessing and as part of an original blessing, that's the theology that would be used, that from the beginning, God created us male and female, and if you carry that out, also, this is not said in the resolution, this is Bob Dannell's words, and also created us gay and straight, um, believing that people discover themselves to be of, of an orientation. Those of us who are straight discovered that we were attracted sexually to the opposite sex. Those who are gay discovered along the way that they're sexually attracted to the same, um, same gender. So um, that that's the way we're made. And if we're made by that, that way, then that's not an aberration. Um, we're made in God's image. And the Episcopal Church then holds to a theology of original blessing. That's, that's really the title of it. And it's um, one that, um, that your, your rector, for two more months, subscribes to. Um, I've changed my mind um, somewhat on this, but I'll, I can get into that later in our discussion. Um, not significantly. I was already on the lean this way 25 years ago. But, you know, we're all sort of um, um, uh, in motion, I would say, on this. None of us have arrived. We're all coming to understanding, right? The Apostle Paul said it this way, this side of heaven, now we see in a mirror dimly, right? Then, on the other side, we'll see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will fully understand. So all of us this side of heaven have to work hard with the Spirit of God to have a fuller understanding about how we're made in God's image and how we're human beings and how we have original blessing. Um, I printed one article. There's a bunch of articles um, that are out there um, that will tell you, give you commentary on this, depending on whether it's conservative or progressive. Uh, but the one that's here listed in your packet says General Convention approves marriage equality. That's from Episcopal News Service. So I thought I'd give you the official article and not, not just a, a, an off commentary like US News and World Report and USA Today and all of them, uh, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, all of them had a commentary on what the Episcopal Church did. So you can go online and read articles again until the cows come home, we say. Um, then the next, uh, a piece in your packet, Communion Partners Salt Lake City Statement. This is, by a min this is a minority voice. This is very common, by the way, at a general convention that those who are not in the majority will produce a min minority voice, a minority opinion. Same thing with the Supreme Court. You have a majority opinion and you have a minority opinion. And it's important, by the way, especially in the Supreme Court, that you and I read both opinions, whether we agree with it or not. You know, you've heard me say this before. I hope you read commentary and people who you don't think you're going to agree with. So if you're a Fox News person, you need to watch some MSNBC. And if you just watch Ra Rachel Maddow, you need to switch it over to Fox News a little bit. We all need to know what each other's saying, although both of those are pretty vitriolic for me. I have to say, I'm, I don't know if you watch either one of those or both, but, uh, but I think it is important that we, we read people who are commentary um, who are not like us. If, if you're a liberal Democrat, you need to read some conservative Republican and vice versa. Um, there's a guy named Ross Duthat who w writes for the New York Times and he sees himself, they see him too, as the conservative writer. He's a very fine writer, by the way. And I've met him on the phone. You know, you can call these people up. You know, we think there's some, there's behind some ivy wall somewhere in New York and no, you just call them up. 
And I just called him up one day. I was going to quote him in a sermon. I didn't know how to say do with that. So I said, <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to say his name right. And he and I got in a long conversation. He knew a lot about the Episcopal Church. And he was asking me questions about the Episcopal Church. We had a great time. He's a good guy, by the way. And he's the conservative writer for the Times. So if you read the Sunday New York Times, don't just read the liberal writers of the Times. Read also the one conservative. <laughs> the one conservative of the New York Times. I haven't heard that the Wall Street Journal has a liberal writer yet, but that would be interesting for them to bring onto their staff someone who's considered the liberal. By the way, the Saturday Wall Street Journal and the Sunday Times, nothing can beat those two in a weekend, by the way. If you want to kind of get a balance, read both of those newspapers um, on a weekend. Um, okay, so this Communion Partners is the minority voice, and our bishop, Paul Lambert, signed this. You, you can see who signed it. And um, they signed it to say that they do not agree with the biblical theological I wouldn't say human rights. I think probably on the biblical and theological and traditional aspects of the, of the discussion, they disagreed with the resolution that we would have a national liturgy that we would, that we would allow for Christian marriage in Episcopal churches um, for gay couples. So this is the minority report. That may not surprise you at all that the Diocese of Dallas, its deputies and its bishop voted against um, the resolution. I think all eight of our deputies and the one bishop that we had on the floor voted against the resolution. Yes? Oh, it resigned. When a bishop retires, they're not allowed to call it a retirement. They resign from being bishop, diocesan bishop. So when James Stanton retired, we called it retirement. But officially, by the canon, he resigns. That's why it says resigns. Yeah. It means that there's, what it means is there's still a bishop. You know, once a bishop, always a bishop in our, our polity. Uh, but they resign from being the diocesan bishop. Yep. Questions? Questions about this statement, about what it means, what it says. I think I just gave you the summary. I'm trying to be as, as re respectful and as gracious as I want to be and can be um, about this. Our bishop, I'm sure, and our deputies have thought long and hard about this and said their prayers, and this is what they came to. Yes? There have been, but now there's going to be one. There's going to be a uniform liturgy. And, but they, you know, because of electronic communication, many of the blessings that were being used around the country before this general convention, or the Christian marriages that were being used, the liturgies, they were being shared. So bishops, you know, see each other all the time. And, you know, the bishop in Kansas might say to the bishop in New York, I got a great liturgy for same-sex marriages. Let me send it to you. Or vice versa. You know, so that it was fairly uniform already. But for some people to use the language that we use in the marriage office, which is traditional language, dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of God to bless the joining together of this man and this woman in holy matrimony. It will now say, I, I didn't read it, but these two people or this person and this person, it, 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 it makes it generic. I think these two people, I think is what it says. Some, it's in front of you. I, have, I don't want to look at all the detail, but yes, question. It could be a time in the future when the national church says we're not going to give diocese individual option anymore. Um, I don't imagine that's going to happen anytime soon. 
my guess is it wouldn't even happen by next general convention. But let me, let me just use one example, although it's, I want to be careful when I use an, um, a parallel example. I don't know whether at all this example would actually play out with this example, but say take women's ordination. So in women's ordination, I was at the general convention in 1976 as an alternate. And um, we approved women's ordination. Many of us were very pleased with that decision. Some of us were not so pleased with that decision. So I don't know if you remember, but that was a, a tough slice. Um, there was a lot, of, a lot, a lot, a lot of, of work that needed to be done in the church about that. So from about 76 until I started seminary in 78, we had the first um, wave of females come into seminary. It was, um, it was an individual diocesan option on whether dioceses were going to ordain women. Um, it, all the way even to now, uh, they would still allow, but they, uh, in the last six years, or maybe nine years, <clears throat> nine years, the last nine years, so two general conventions ago, they decided, we're going to send a commission of uh, bishops, priests, and laity to the, to the three dioceses that are left that are not ordaining women to have kind of a come to Jesus meeting. <laughs> Like, you know, we've been at this a long time and y'all hadn't gotten the message. <laughs> like, there's something really deficient about you because you still are not ordaining women. And one of them was our next door neighbor, Fort Worth. So Peter Lee, who was the Bishop of Virginia then, had the terrible duty of being the chair of that, of that group that had to go over and meet with Jack Iker. You can imagine that was a very warm and caring meeting. <laughs> Yeah, come on over to my backyard and let's have a barbecue and let you, let you scold me for a couple hours. Um, I'm not sure that we ought to do it that way in the future. I don't think, I think we realized that was probably not the better part of valor. Um, but you can see from 1976 until into the 2000s, so at least 25 years, we went with individual option. I don't know that it's going to be that long on this topic. But we are going to give some room of variety and diversity. And um, there's going to be a time, though. There will be a time in the future. I don't know how long. Maybe not in our lifetime when the National Church says, that's it. The law of the land and the law of the church is you will do this. Now, do, can, the, can the federal government make me celebrate a wedding? No. I, I have to... People have come up to me and said, well, I'm really against this and because they're going to make you do gay marriage. As if that would necessarily be hard for me. That was an interesting question that they didn't ask me how I feel about this before they get into this. But, <laughs> um, but I said, you know, the federal government cannot tell me what to do about sacraments in the church. And they go, yes, it can. I thought, no, it can't. They've never been able to tell me anything about church liturgy. And they won't. Separation of church and state. They can't tell me what to do in terms of the church's liturgical rights. So when you, when you have friends who tell you this, allay their fears. No minister of any religion alive in the United States has to do anything according to the federal government. Okay? Yes. that we've gone back on ourselves? Yeah. Hmm, it's a good question. Um, I don't know. Well, we did on alcohol. <laughs> Remember? The law of the land was you can have a drink. The law of the land was you can't have a drink. The law of the land is you can have a drink. Yeah, we rolled back um, um, alcohol. And I think the church was probably part of it. My grandmother, by the way, on my mother's side, my maternal grandmother, Edith, I've preached about her before. She was a tough southern magnolia and no drinking and no dancing either. And she had a lot of other lists that were sins. And um, <laughs> my grandfather, Elmer, I've preached about him too. He used to make his own liquor and she didn't know that. <laughs> so this was the rule. 
the rule was when we were out hunting and fishing with my grandfather on our farm is we could have some swigs of his liquor and you didn't take too many swigs of his liquor <laughs> as long as if you ever tell grandmama you can never have liquor again <laughs> and so we were definitely quiet <laughs> we wanted to have some swigs of that liquor and so um, my grandmother never knew um, I don't know how she didn't know because you could you could smell that stuff a mile away but we used to eat black licorice <laughs> that takes the smell of anything on your lips um, off by the way anyway so these are the bishops who signed the minority report let me move on and then um, then The Bishop, Bishop Lambert uh, is the minority vo voice, is, is one of the sign signatures uh, on the minority voice. You cannot have, uh, uh, priests uh, in, this, in this diocese um, cannot officiate um, at same-sex marriages in our churches or anywhere in the diocese, the geography of the diocese, not just in the buildings. Uh, the, but we have a canon in the diocese also that says the same thing. So it's not just the bishop's authority, it's also the canon of the Diocese of Dallas. So if I were to officiate at a, at a gay uh, marriage, uh, then I would be breaking two things, the authority of the bishop and the canon of the Diocese of Dallas. What would happen to a priest who did such a thing? Um, I don't know is the answer. <clears throat> I have no idea what would happen. People have already asked me. That's why I say I don't know. I haven't checked into that. Yes. Yeah, there, that's another provision, though, that's, that's in addition to the liturgy that's passed, they're all, the church is always working on liturgies and music. So it's not just about um, marriage equality where we're working on liturgy, it's also a lot of other things. And so um, what's going to happen, though, they did commission this time that we would, uh, that we would put together, uh, we have that one commission, remember, out of the two that's left liturgy and music. They're to work on the formulation of a new prayer book that may or may not make you go, oh, not that again. Well, it's been since the 70s since we worked on that. It's a long time ago. We had the, remember we had the zebra? Some of you remember zebra and the green book? Raise your hand if you remember the green book. Zebra? Yeah. Uh, some of you blessedly were not around and didn't, don't remember of those days. We also had the new hymnal, remember, from the 1940 hymnal to the 1982 hymnal. My father was a, a, was a deputy at General Convention the year they were bringing the hymnal. You know, he was a big Navy man, was a Navy pilot in World War II, and they were not going to have the Navy hymn in the new hymnal. He was just about ha to have an aorta over this. I mean, he was writing letters to any bishop and any deputy who would listen to him. And it was white knuckle for him. I mean, it was down and dirty. He was going to, I think it was Anaheim that year, and he was loaded for bear. And of course, at the, at the opening hearing, uh, they, he took all of his flame out of his, out of his machinery because they said, we've reconsidered about 25 hymns, and he saw on the list the Navy hymn. So it was like, gum. I... <laughs> I got all fired up and I was all ready for my political movement and it's back in the, hem, back in the hymnal. So he was, he was a happy man. Eternal Father, strong to save. One of the great hymns that's ever been written. So anyway, um, communion across the differences. What this was is the, the bishops as a whole, the House of Bishops, then realizing what had been passed and the minority voice then put forward this resolution which has to do with grace and uni unity and um, a appreciation for difference. It's really, really a nice statement. I say that in front of the video.
I said this to Bishop Lambert, that the House of Bishops is basically saying to the Diocese of Dallas, whether you agree with our bishop or not, we, we find it of great value that we live in a big tent and we know you don't agree with the majority voice and we're, we're, ha we're happy that you are respectfully offering a minority voice and we want to honor and respect that voice and your place in our church. So I have said to the Bishop Lambert, um, the rector and some of the people at St. Michael would like to have the same type of affirmation and appreciation in the Diocese of Dallas. He, um, he responded to my um, note um, with graciousness, I might add. I haven't seen any evidence yet, but, <laughs> but I think, um, uh, and I've, I'll get to B uh, Bishop-elect Sumner in a minute, but and then when we got back from, when they got back from General Convention, then our um, standing committee produced a statement, which they're quite allowed to do, and that's next in your packet, and that's uh, signed by David Houck, um, and the rest of the standing committee. This is basically affirming Bishop Lambert's and the, our dep deputation's view on things and is affirming a traditional view of holy matrimony and affirming that we have a canon in the diocese and affirming that Bishop Lambert is already said he will not allow any of us to officiate at um, same-sex marriages in the diocese and it's it's about as clear as anything could be. Um, I also wrote David Houck, um, as I wrote Bishop Lambert, I also wrote David Houck to um, say that I respect um, the authority of the standing committee to make a statement. Um, I, I've been on standing committees, so it's not like I haven't been there, done that. And um, that I want them to know that I respect our polity and that they have spoken uh, I want you to know that I wrote personally, not on behalf of St. Michael, to say I disagree with your views. Not only do I disagree, the primary place I disagree with, um, with the standing committee's views is they, they said that the reason why we did this as a national church is simply based on human rights. And I wanted to um, respectfully say to him, it's not just human rights. It is that, but it's based also on on the way that some of us read scripture and the ways that we understand theology and the way that we understand ethics. This is not just human rights. And that's a, it's a common argument that the liberals base this just simply on human rights. And we who read the scriptures correctly are basing this on scripture. It's very dangerous for any of us individually to say, I read the scriptures correctly you don't. Um, we, those of us who've been around the church a long time, we know better than that. He did acknowledge, he didn't say, I do acknowledge um, that a, a, um, a legitimate read of scripture could have a differing view. He did not say that. He did write me a cordial note back and said, we will all do the very best we can uh, to get along and come along in the diocese. It was a gracious, respectful note, but he didn't, he didn't address individually um, uh, what I had addressed in my note. Uh, then next, uh, Bishop-elect Sumner um, has written a letter to the diocese, gracious letter saying he wants to be the bishop of the whole diocese of everybody, uh, but he does hold, no surprise to any of us, hold a traditional teaching on Christian marriage and that he affirms um, the minority voice that was signed by our Bishop Lambert and uh, by the standing committee's um, statement that was sent out. He affirms them in the, the letter to all of us. Um, um, just, to, just by way of personal note, um, uh, Valerie and I uh, took uh, Bishop-elect Sumner to dinner um, the other week. Um, our initiation, no agenda. We just wanted to take the bishop out to dinner uh, as the rector. Um, I hope that you appreciate um, that I was sort of representing us and myself and my wife uh, in taking him to dinner. He's, he's a very likable guy, respectful, smart. He's been the uh, principal, the uh, de dean of a seminary, has an earned PhD. He's a very bright person, very cordial, very respectful. I think you'll find him that way. Um, 
We did not talk about church politics. We didn't talk about reading scripture. We didn't talk about sex. <laughs> I think we talked about things like, you know, like your children and movies and regular stuff, you know. Um, it, was, it was an overture. Um, it, was not, it was not grandstanding. It was not anything. It was just cordial. It was just a, a way for the rector of St. Michael to say, welcome to the diocese. You know, all of our parents taught us this. Uh, whether you like somebody or not, whether you agree with their views or not, we're all, we're all together. We're a family, and you welcome, them. you welcome them here. And you open up your door, and you roll out the carpet, and you say, come to dinner, right? And that's what we did, and we had a good evening together, and I think began to build a good relationship. And then he and I met uh, for about an hour and a half, uh, a few days later in my, my office. Just a little bit of a kernel about that. Um, who is this guy um, and what does he stand for? Well, the first question out of his mouth in my office was to ask me, well, what do you think that I should give my attention to during the first couple years of being the bishop? And I, I said to him, well, before I answer your question, I want you to know that I've been in the diocese eight years and you're the very first person from the diocese who's ever asked me one question. <laughs> he looked at me and he thought, really? And I said, yeah, w even one question. I've never had anyone from the diocese ask me about my family, about where I'm from, about how I'm doing. When my wife has surgery, I've never gotten a call or a note from anybody. Um, I'm, I'm talking, folks, I'm telling you that this diocese has been in a sad condition, very sad condition. And our new bishop-elect, first thing out of his mouth was to ask me a question. I thought, wow. <laughs> I mean, I was like a, like a kid in a candy store. I mean, so I said, well, let me give you a hose instead of a hydrant, because I would really like to give you a hydrant, but I'm going <laughs> to... I'm smart enough and I've been around the church long enough that I'm just going to give you a few things. Uh, we'll, this will be to be continued conversation. But I did say to him, I just want you to know what I said to him because it has to do with you and us together. I said, I want you to know that St. Michael is a fabulous congregation. We are, we've had a fabulous history here and we are a big tent congregation and we're the largest big tent congregation Anglican church in the world, not just in the communion. I'm not just in the United States. I'm talking big tent now. We're the largest big tent congregation in the Anglican communion. And it's a wonderful congregation. And I love it because we, we honestly respect and value wherever people are. They can be conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats. They can read the scriptures one way and another way. And, um, and it's really, really a wonderful place. But our diocese has not appreciated it lately. Craig remembers a time when it was appreciated. But it, not lately. And not in my time. And you can change that. He said, how do you suppose that I, w that, that I should do that? I said, it's real easy, Bishop-elect Sumner. You and I learned this in undergrad in Human Relations 101. Be nice. <laughs> Be nice. Hang out with us. It's a fun congregation. We're a lot, I said to him, I'll t tell you on the video, we're a lot more fun than Incarnation. <laughs> kind of buttoned up, you know, and afraid of saying things, might be worried that I have a few doubts about something in the Christian faith. We're, we're not uh, bashful about all, any of those things. We just are. We're honest, fun, wide open, friendly. Be friendly and hang out with us and honor and respect what we are. And we will, and, and, and be with us, get to know us. And what you'll discover is that this is a wonderful congregation. And, and, um, and, I, and I, he said, well, how did, what would be your, the first step? I said, this is also really easy. 
He had his note paper out by now. <laughs> and I said, uh, why don't you invite all the former wardens, senior and junior wardens, to have dinner with you? There's 38 living. I'm going to have dinner with y'all, by the way, if you're one of the former wardens before I leave, because I love that group. I love that group. It's a wonderful group of people. And um, I'm going to have dinner selfishly in September this year rather than November because I'm going to be gone. And so I said, why don't you invite the former junior and senior wardens? They're, they're, they're not all progressive. Some of them are conservative and traditionalists. It's a great group. He said, just have dinner. And I said, yeah, just have dinner. Break bread. Let them know who you are a little bit. Ask them questions, though. Who are you and what's important on your mind? And tell me about the history of you being in the diocese. And, um, and guess what? The word will get out. It will. All you got, a few people just tell the people at the exchange. <laughs> and it'll be all over Dallas. You know what? This is how it goes. You know what? That nice new bishop had dinner with my husband the other night. <laughs> and we think he's a really nice guy. This is the way it'll go. It will. And I said, you will hit a grand slam at St. Michael. He said, really? And I said, it's that easy. <laughs> it really is. Anyway, he was taking notes. And uh, I, I had a good meeting with him, and our time is almost up. Let me go on to what else we did. We, we elected a new presiding bishop, Michael Curry, who was with us. Yeah. Yeah, Michael Curry. He is one dynamic human being. And um, as he said in his sermon at the General Convention, he um, had a great moment when he honored um, retiring presiding Bishop Catherine Jeffers Shorey, who's also one of our people. We also had her, and I'm a big fan of hers. And um, I was rooting for her all the way. And, um, but she is cerebral. She's a scientist, and so she doesn't light up a room. We all know that because she was here, but she's very bright and very thoughtful and a very caring person. But she is, she lives in here a lot. And um, Michael Curry said uh, in his opening sermon, you know, I'm just kind of wide open. This is the way he's talking. I'm kind of wide open, and I just kind of speak. And he said, I'm going to learn some things about being cool from Catherine Jeffers Shorey. <laughs> She's going to teach me about cool. <laughs> what he meant by that is sort of, you know, <laughs> you know, cerebral and thoughtful and bright and all that. I mean, Michael's very bright, by the way. Um, but he's very different from Catherine Jefferson. So the pendulum has swung. The other thing that you, wa you want to know about Michael Curry is he's equally passionate about evangelism as he is social justice. I think you heard him say that when he was here. But if you're an evangelical and you like to live in the Bible and you like, you like the church to speak about Jesus more than it does, Michael's your man. If you like the church to really dig in its, you know, its fiber into what's wrong in society and be prophetic and deal with the, the stuff that I was dealing with in my sermon today about breaking down walls that divide us, Michael's your man. Okay, so what's really great about this guy is He's as passionate about evangelism and being evangelical as he is being progressive and into social, in, in, in social action. So he's, he's your guy. Um, and the fact that he's African-American is just gravy on top. Um, so he's been a friend of mine for 30, 34 years. And um, I've seen him, I mean, it's, it's been a wonderful journey. And, um, by the way, just so you know, um, I've invited him. I don't know, this is not for public, except it's on video. <laughs> um, I've, invited him, I've invited him to stay the, the weekend um, of the consecration of our bishop, which, by the way, our bishop-elect has invited the presiding bishop, and he's accepted to be here on the 14th of November to be part of the consecration of bishop-elect George Sumner. Um, our former bishop would not invite the presiding bishop here, Catherine Jeffers Shorey, 
That's why we invited her to come here. That, you remember all that. Um, I said to our bishop, if you'll let her come to St. Michael, then that'll be her official visit to the diocese. It was a win for Bishop Stanton. It was a win for Catherine Jeffers Shorey. It was definitely a win for us. Um, we don't have to do all that now. Uh, Michael Curry is coming at the invitation of George Sumner and will be the principal officiating officer at the consecration. That's on Saturday. I've invited him to stay then I'll let you know on the 15th of November to be the preacher and celebrant here. That would be a great, great thing for us. Um, I've also invited though, I want you to know, um, Bishop-elect Sumner to be a, the pr a preacher and celebrant here before he's consecrated. He starts in September. He's consecrated on the 14th of November. So sometime between his starting in September and his consecration in November, I've invited him to be a preacher and a celebrant because we're a big tent congregation, right? And if we mean that we're a big tent congregation, then we invite conservatives to be a preacher in our pulpit. And I mean that. And I have had conservatives preach in our pulpit, not just progressive preachers. So I, if you're more traditional, I want you to know this is your church. Just like if you're liberal and progressive, this is your church. So that's nice. And then the last thing to say is the budget imperatives uh, for the three-year budget until the next general convention also have some interesting pieces in it and that it has has some new initiatives for evangelism especially guess what high school college and young adults glory be yeah evangelism and mission work for high school college and young adults because if we don't get after this folks we're going to be graying more and more and more into into diminishment. So um, I'm very happy about the budget initiatives, very happy about Michael Curry. It is what it is on the provision for same-sex marriage, and I'm definitely in favor of the reorganization of the national church. Um, and then one brief more word um, is um, I want to be fair to myself and to you. Um, I don't think anyone from the mid-70s when I got into the business of being a um, seminarian ordained as a priest uh, to now, I don't think any of us um, along the way can say, I absolutely was settled about the Bible and sexuality all the way through. I haven't met anybody who says, except in, if, unless you're just a, over to the right arch conservative and you never change anything in your life or progressive liberal, usually the way out 1% on either side, they say, I haven't changed a thing or my views about anything my entire life. That's the person to stay away from, by the way. <laughs> um, most of us have said, I've moved some ways on things, right? We have a greater understanding about all kinds of things, including now for me, the Bible and human sexuality. You know, the Dallas Morning News made a big deal because that's how you sell papers. Made a big deal about how Mark Anschutz voted at the general convention in 04 and how I voted. That was in the headlines when I was coming. I thought, really, um, the church and our ministries is so much more than just one vote at one general convention. But that's, of course, what was on everybody's mind. What the paper d didn't know and still doesn't know, but what Mark and I know is that Mark and I are um, just to name two people, we're a lot more in line with a lot of issues about this than would meet the eye. And um, so, yes, on one morning, 900 of us gathered, and he voted one way as a deputy from the Diocese of Dallas, and I voted another way as a deputy from the Diocese of Upper South Carolina. But um, Valerie knows um, until the very minute that I was voting, I was just as likely to vote yes on that measure. Um, Gene Robinson, by the way, sat next to me for two weeks. We got to know each other very well. He's a good person. Um, I think I've rehearsed some of this for y'all. but um, And it was a very, very, very difficult matter because um, there were a lot of issues involved in that. The International Anglican Communion, how we read scripture, human rights, um, liturgies, sacraments. There were a whole lot of issues, you know, all the way back. That was 12 years ago now, folks. So that was 2003. Did I say four? 2003. So 12 years ago, 
was a long time ago, and a lot of water over the dam. Um, I was already beginning to read the scriptures differently in those days. Uh, Amy Jill Levine, by the way, I hired her, literally hired her. Um, two other clergy and I hired her for a whole afternoon. We went over to Nashville. We got her out of Vanderbilt, out of her ivy-covered walls, and came over and met with the three of us. And we sat from 1 o'clock until 5 o'clock, and we picked her brain three weeks before the general convention. That's not public news. Now it is. But, um, and we, um, we wanted a Jewish, very bright New Testament scholar to sit in the midst of us and teach us about the New Testament and human sexuality. So uh, for a whole afternoon, we said, what about that passage? What about that passage? What about the Leviticus? Because we didn't just touch New Testament. And so with that and with a lot of other help from scholars, um, some of us began to read the scriptures with a fresh air about this. And fast forward then, a lot of years over the, over the dam, um, uh, I really read the scriptures quite differently from, um, from maybe 30 years ago. Uh, I don't know many people who don't, by the way. Um, and um, I see in the scriptures this theology of original blessing. Uh, there's nothing that Jesus ever said or ever stated that gets in the way of me um, um, agreeing with full marriage equality, biblically speaking. Biblically speaking. That's just me. That's not St. Michael and all angels. I'm glad for you to disagree with me. I'm leaving in a couple months, by the way. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, but I just want you to know that, uh, that none of us should come to this easily. We should do our study. We should look into the scriptures. We should get help like I did from Amy Jill Levine, who's coming here again, by the way, this fall. I hope you all come in here. Um, anyway, so biblically, I, when I read the scriptures, um, I see full marriage equality. Nothing that's in the scriptures gets in the way of me understanding how God blesses two people in holy matrimony, gay and straight. Um, do I expect that gay couples should abide by the same promise keeping that, that straight couples do? Of course. Promise making and promise keeping is true for all of us, whether we're single or married or divorced and remarried. In any of those capacities, promise making and promise keeping is also part of Jesus's um, regular teaching, right, has to do with honoring and respecting each other, loving each other. Um, so we would expect the same thing of gay couples as we do as straight couples. The gay couples, though, the gay community has been saying to us, guess what, folks? Y'all hadn't had a very good track record. 50% of your marriages end in divorce. So, um, you know, we have a ways to go as straight couples, right? I mean, come on. Uh, so we're all in this together. I also agree with marriage equality on theological terms. Systematic narrative, choose your theology, I don't care, poetic theology, whatever slice of theology you, you want to work with me on, um, I think Christian theology, Judeo-Christian theology affirms, in my view, full marriage equality. And of course, then civil rights. Um, I don't think there's a way around that part, by the way. I think. Um, even if you're against having gay marriage in the Episcopal Church, almost everyone that I know of who's reasonably thinking thinks, well, at least the United States had to allow uh, full access legally for people to be in a union with each other. That the government cannot decide whether two men or two women can be together in their life together. I don't, I mean, that's a that's actually a pretty easy ethic that most people had already crossed over long ago. Almost like now, we can't, we can't even begin to think these days of how we um, uh, blocked blacks from having full access. Anyone who's reasonable and has a heart cannot fathom the way we used to treat the scriptures and the way we used to treat society in terms of the Jim Crow laws. Most of us just think that was an abomination. And we're very sad about that part of our history. 
Um, but it's not just black and gay. It's, we still have some work to do in a lot of ranges. Um, Islamic phobia is on the rise, by the way. And, um, and so uh, we still have, you know, people will come up to Sikhs. You know, Sikhs, that, uh, that's not Muslim. <laughs> Sikhs and, and be mad at them in some way, you know, this sort of, um, now do I think the Muslim community has some work to do? Oh yeah, they got some work to do. Us non-Muslims have some work to do. We all have some work to do. I'm still, I still want the moderate Muslims to speak more, right? I want them to say more. I want them to say this does not represent our religion. I know they are, they're coming, it's, it's coming, but I want them to say more about how you know, because, you know, the outcry in Charleston was really heartening, wasn't it? It was really heartening. I mean, Christians around the United States would not have this anymore. I mean, we had reached our saturation point. It wasn't just Charleston. It was everywhere of all denominations. We were just totally just, ugh, this thing that happened in Charleston. And that's good. Christ the Christian community really came forward on that. And the Muslim community's got to come forward like that, by the way. You got to say when a Muslim shoots uh, soldiers at bases, which that happened in Chattanooga, it does not represent our religion. So uh, a little, that's a little bit of personal declaration. But it's, um, it's come, it's still coming, I'm still working on these things. I hope you're still working on these things too. None of us have arrived. We still have more scriptures to read. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not glad for you to disagree with me. <laughs> I want you actually to agree with me. Uh, but if you do disagree with me, I want you to know that in this church, you have a full place um, of whatever your view is. And as long as I'm the rector, I will ensure that that will be a, a, a respectful, harmonious, charitable environment. Um, questions, comments, yes? Yeah, we've had to, um, the, the way that the liturgy and the canon have had to adjust itself was to, is to say that the sacrament of holy matrimony is now gender neutral, would be the quickest way to say it. The sacrament of holy matrimony. Oh, well, yeah, I think the people who were working on the liturgy um, were, tr were trying to maintain the, 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 the language of fidelity and promise making and promise keeping and the traditional language. They just, the liturgy makes it gender neutral now, though. So it's, the sacrament is no longer, so this is one example of the way that it would shift some of the, some of the theology and not just the language would be that in the, especially in the Roman Catholic Church, there's a traditional view that the primary reason why a man and a woman enter into the sacrament of holy matrimony is for procreation. That still is, by the way, the primary reason named by Rome to be the, the impetus for people to be married is for procreation. But this liturgy would, um, the Episcopal Church has not agreed with that, by the way. That's the first thing to say, is that we don't think it's the primary reason why people get married. Because there's plenty of people who get married who don't intend to have children, right? And we think that's uh, equally blessed, would be the way we'd put it. So there's some features about the traditional language about fidelity and about um, lifelong union and about procreation and having children that will need to be altered in the liturgy because right now it says now uh, but g gay couples are adopting children though so I don't know how it'll finally read I'm not on the liturgy and music commission uh, but they will they will bring together a liturgy that will be um, um, that will be a national liturgy now how that's 
how that's going to finally appear in a new prayer book and whether we have a right one and a right two, that is a right for straight marriage and a right for gay marriage. I don't know that that's what they're going to do. So I'm, I'm really a dangerous person to ask the question because I'm not in any of those circles. But I'm just guessing. Yeah, Roy. Uh, you answer, you answer. Okay. Um, yeah, it could be right one, right two. Um, you know, we have different blessings though now, like um, there's called the Book of Occasional Services where there's a liturgy for blessing like a church and that language is different from blessing a house. And so it's not an aberration that we would have different liturgies for different occasions, right? I think the Episcopal Church would have done exactly what it did regardless of the Supreme Court. Um, I think we would have said though, obviously if we live in states, this is already the, the individual choice of bishops before, then we needed the, the law of the church. The law of the church is that we will, that we will have a national liturgy and we will allow this across the board except we'll make exceptions for the diocesan bishops who choose not to allow it. We are allowing that right now, as we already talked about. Before, though, this general convention, we did allow individual option. The Diocese of Texas, for example, was already allowing then three churches. The bishop was allowing three churches to have same-sex blessings. They were using a liturgy for blessings. Now that the law of the land is they can be married, those same three, now four churches, by the way, in the Diocese of Texas, will have Christian marriage rather than gay blessings, right? So the, uh, the union, though, the, there would be very little difference, though, in the language they were using in the blessings they had, say, in Austin. St. David's in Austin is one of the churches, by the way, downtown. If you went to UT, you know St. David's downtown. That's one of the churches. So the, uh, the clergy of St. David's has been having um, same-sex blessings. Now they're gonna have same-sex marriage. Um, but the Episcopal Church would have done this regardless of the Supreme Court. One more question, then we'll be done. When announced there is a budget for evangelizing the youth and young adult ministry, does that mean that we no longer have to evangelize our friends and family? <laughs> <laughs> The, the most effective and the cheapest way to evangelize is to tell your friends about Jesus. <laughs> and to encourage them to be part of a Christian journey and to, and to be part of the church. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you again for the, this beloved church. Um, it, it's very often a blessing. Sometimes it's an irritation. We ask you to be in the middle of us to be um, the center of the grace that we experience as the body of Christ. And that regardless of where we are, that we have a great measure of respect and understanding for each other. That we listen well, we continue to study, and we say our prayers. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. <laughs>